If we look at our educational system in the world today and the media, we see that the only topic that is really represented in the world out there is the evolution side of this debate. And the other side, the creation side, is passed by. And so we're going to ask a few questions, just a little bit about my background. I used to be an evolutionist, professor of zoology, and I became a creationist based on evidence in the world out there. Now I'm not here today to bludgeon someone into another point of view, but just to ask a few questions. And that is what we intend to do. Now, in about in 2008, some interesting things happened in the world, and the evolution debate had progressed to such an extent that it was felt that the churches should all come on board regarding this issue as well. And so they started what was called the Clergy Letter Project, where they invited the clergy to put pen to paper and to support the evolution scenario, even from the pulpit. And they first started with an evolution day, then it progressed to an evolution weekend, and they thought they would get a number of signatures, but before they could say Jack Robinson, they had 11,730 signatures, and uh, a number of signatures from rabbis. These are clerics theologians who say that the evolution scenario is the only one that fits the picture and the public needs to be informed that the biblical paradigm is to, at best to be seen allegorically. So we, the undersigned Christian clergy from many different traditions, believe that the timeless truths of the Bible and discoveries of modern science may comfortably coexist. We believe that the theory of evolution is a foundational scientific truth, one that has stood up to rigorous scrutiny and upon which much of human knowledge and achievement rests. I fail to see where this statement comes from, but nevertheless. To reject this truth or to treat it as one theory amongst others is to deliberately embrace scientific ignorance and transmit such ignorance to our children. So this is where we are in the stream of time. It seems as if the theological world has succumbed to the pressure from the scientific world and has decided to capitulate on the biblical scenario of creation. By 2009 it had progressed to an evolution weekend and they had annual Evolution Sunday events, and these were so successful that they transformed them into Evolution Weekends, where from the pulpit, the people, the lay people, were to be educated that the Bible and science were to be harmonized, and that the creation account should not be seen as literal, but sort of be incorporated in some theistic evolutionary paradigm or seen totally as allegorical. Fascinating. If you turn on the media, it doesn't take more than 30 seconds to hear that everything is millions of years old, and children from an early age are indoctrinated that there is only one paradigm that exists, and then legislation in the world, in terms of education, enforces the teaching of evolution in secondary institutions, public schools, and all of these avenues. Now one of the great proponents of the evolution theory today is of course the world famous Richard Dawkins, and uh, he wrote the famous book The God Delusion, where he uh, bemoans the fact that religion should have had such a prominent place in the history of mankind. And it seems to me that he misinterprets religion in the sense that he looks at certain denominations with certain denominational views rather than the biblical view. Nevertheless, 
He also belongs to an organization known as the Brights. Now, it's an interesting name. To be bright means to be intelligent, means to be a luminary, means to have light. Now, what does it take to be a bright? So, if we go to their webpage, we find that a bright is someone who believes that there is no God. So, it seems you have to be incredibly intelligent to reach the point where you realize that there is no God. And it's interesting that the constituency of brights is usually hugely diverse. Besides those, of course, who identify themselves as atheists or humanists or secular humanists or free th thinkers or rationalists, naturalists, agnostics, skeptics, whatever, there are individuals who go by their preferred affiliation, such as ethical culturalist, pantheist, Buddhist, yogi, Wiccan, transhumanist, Unitarian. Well, that's odd already, but then it gets really interesting. Also part of the gamut of constituents are Jews, Catholics, Quakers, Episcopalians, and others who may personally maintain their religious, cultural, or aesthetic aspect, but not its supernaturalism. So it seems that you can belong to a Christian grouping, either Catholic, or Protestant, or any one of the others, and still be a bride. In other words, you can believe there is no God, but you can be part of a denomination. So you don't embrace any of the supernatural aspects. You're just a cultural Christian. You like the culture of Christianity. Now, that's rather fascinating. So you can be a bright and not believe in God. In fact, in our, our country, where I come from, there was a massive debate because there were theologians and preachers preaching from the pulpit who didn't believe in God. And some of the, uh, <laughs> the people were, well, upset about this issue and tried to do something about it. But it is their human right to have their belief. And so some of these people are fully employed by churches, but they don't believe in God. So we're living in interesting times. Now, when they started this evolution weekend, they also decided to make it pretty public and they put advertisements on London buses where they claimed there's probably no God, so, you know, relax and enjoy life. Now, originally they wanted to place the advertisement, there is no God, but because that was offensive to some, they compromised on there is probably no God, which is a misnomer in itself. And uh, then they also put up posters claiming, in the beginning, man created God. There's probably no God. So this is where we are in the stream of time. And why has it come to this point? And why is there such obvious disbelief in the issues of the Bible? Now in Genesis chapter 1 verse 31 we read, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So according to the scriptures, God created everything in six days, and it was very good. And of course, if you look at this world today, it looks anything but very good. There are major problems on this planet. In Genesis 1, 26 to 28, we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and all the things that are on this earth, every creeping thing. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female created he them. Well, these are controversial issues already because here you have a definite statement of intent creating man in the image of God. In other words, not evolving from some inferior uh, organic material to something superior, but in the image of God. And then still male and female, a distinction which today 
is tremendously under fire. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish and of the sea and over the fowls of the air and every living thing that creeps upon the earth. So here is a story where man is put in control, he's given dominion. In other words, it is a mini-cosmos with man in control, and he was in the image of God. And Isaiah tells us in chapter 43, I, I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yes, I have made him. Now when you study this issue of, of glory, then you find out that the glory of God is his character. So he created them for his glory in his image, in his character. So what is this, this character that we're talking about? And what is this image? And why was it very good? And why, the counter question, is it not very good today? Well, Genesis continues to say, and God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. So there is the original diet of man, and we can see that everything that God gave man to eat came from the plant kingdom. So he was a vegetarian. But then it gets fascinating because it says also to Every, that's a very strong word, it embraces everything. Every beast of the earth, every bird of the air, everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food and it was so. So, purely on the strength of the text, everything that creeps, everything that lives, everything that lived on this planet of the animal kingdom, was herbivorous, plant-eating. Now, hang on a second, <laughs> that's ludicrous. Where do, the, where do the carnivores fit into this picture? Is there any room for them? Surely they are designed to kill and to hunt, and uh, this picture just doesn't, doesn't match with the reality that we see. And then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So it was evening, and it was morning, the sixth day, and it was so. That's pretty emphatic. So this was the original plan. Everything was vegetarian. The plant kingdom was created, according to the scripture, as a source of food for all the creatures on the planet, including man, including every other creature that existed on the planet. Because there was to be no death of those creatures whose life was in the blood. So death did not exist. Now according to the evolutionary paradigm, death is the very means by which we fuel the evolutionary process. So this is the antithesis of modern thinking. Survival of the fittest implies the death of the non-fit. Now Charles Darwin, when he accepted this position as naturalist for the voyage of the Beagle, he uh, was, of course, theologically trained, but he also was a biologist, and his grandfather had dabbled in evolutionary thinking, and on this trip he had a book with him by Charles Lyell, The Principles of Geology, which postulated long ages. And as he was traveling around, he came to certain conclusions, and he wrote to his friend, Dr. Arthur Gray, I'm bewildered. I had no intention to write atheistically, but I own that I cannot see so plainly as others do and as I wish to do. Evidence for design and beneficence on all sides of us. It doesn't look so good. There seems to me too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the ichnomunidae it's a category of parasites, with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars or that a cat should play with mice. So when I look at the natural world around me, I see suffering. I see animals parasiting other animals 
I see carnivores killing their prey, tearing them apart. This is not a, a utopian world. This doesn't match the theory or the story in the Bible. And we have to admit he has a point, but perhaps he missed something. In 1844, in his first draft of his famous book, The Origin of Species, he comes out a little stronger and he says it's derogatory that the creator of countless universes should have made by individual acts of his will the myriads of creeping parasites and worms which since the earliest dawn of life have swarmed over the land and the depth of the ocean. So this is a bad picture we're painting of God by looking at nature. And then he ponders his evolutionary paradigm and he says, well, if we, if we look at evolution, well, then we cease to be astonished that a group of animals should have been transformed to lay their eggs in the bowels and flesh of other sensitive beings, that some animals should live by and delight in cruelty, that animals should be led away by false instincts, that annually there should be an incalculable waste of pollen, eggs and immature beings, so looking at it from the evolutionary paradigm made sense to him. The two don't match. And Darwin saw this. And this is the very basis, the very seed of the theory of evolution. But did he perhaps miss something? Let's have a look at the scriptures again. The scriptures surely tell us that from the original perfect state, something changed. So we need to have a look at that. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard the voice in the garden and I was afraid. It was, a something, it was something new, fear. And I was naked. It was something new. And I hid myself and I said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman you gave me, it's her problem. She created the problem. And uh, I did eat, and the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, It's the serpent's fault. He beguiled me. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and upon the belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So something strange happens here. The serpent is cursed. Not the perpetrators, the serpent. Now the serpent, of course, was just a median used by the other entity who was known as Satan. And he used this medium to beguile them. And as a reference point and an indicator for future generations, a curse was placed upon the serpent and it was now to crawl on its belly. So I can assume that prior to this, it did not crawl on its belly. Now, if I look at the reptile world, you have lizards and reptiles that have vastly reduced legs. You have some that are totally legless. The serpents are generally legless, but some of them actually have rudimentary legs, and some of them develop them embryologically, but they do not come to the forefront. So something obviously changed. But here is the hub. If there are legs and they are perfectly formed, just rudimentary, then do they have the genes for legs, yes or no? Obviously they must have the genes, otherwise they couldn't have the structure. So why are they rudimentary? Did it take millions of years of evolution? Is this progress or is this regression? Is it a step back or is it a step forward? And so we can see that nothing new has been added, only something has been lost or deactivated. If you look at other structures, which evolutionists would claim developed over millions of years, like the apparatus to kill, the poison glands and the teeth associated with it. Well, the poison glands are really transformed salivary glands. 
So if you have a transformed gland that uh, produces enzymes, which are proteins, well, that wouldn't be a problem if they ended in your stomach and you could digest the protein, but if the protein ended up in your bloodstream, it could create a tremendous reaction, an immune response. And so this is not something that was added. This is not some new invention. This is a transformation of something that already existed. The same applies to spiders and the web that they spin. Some spiders subsist on pollen for at least a period of their lives and the poison glands again are transformed structures, not new additions. So they are digestive structures. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, I don't know if there's a lesson in there which we should take note of, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Here again, the first curse is upon the serpent as a reminder. The second curse is not upon Adam and Eve, but upon the ground and for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Now the herb of the field was originally the food for the animals, and the fruit and the seeds, the nuts, the grains, and all of these issues were for man. So now the herbs are added, so we could say vegetables were added to the diet, Obviously, there would be a shortage because of the curse, which had to be augmented with the additional food. And then what happened? In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So here was the sentence of death. It was delayed, but it would be implemented over time through aging, and dust they were, dust they would become. So the earth is cursed. What does this mean? Obviously it means it won't bring forth what it did before. And whereas before everything grew effortlessly, now it took labor and sweat to produce the same. And why? For their sake. Well, you know, if I look at the world today, if everything is honky-dory and the rains come when they should come and the crops are, are growing as they should and the wind comes at the right time for pollination, everybody is complacent and happy and nobody needs God. But let the droughts come and the withering winds and let the crops deteriorate. Then everybody turns to God so that he shouldn't be forgotten because if you forget the source of life, well, then you might have to forfeit life. So this was a reminder that man was still dependent on a higher power in order to subsist on the land. All right, then the structures were changed. Thorns and thistles would henceforth be part of this creation. So I assume that before, thorns and thistles were not part of this creation because they were to be a bothersome intruder in the cultivation process that Adam had to undertake. Now what are thorns? Are these new structures? No. There's no new genetic material here. A thorn is merely a transformed branch or a cortical outgrowth. And uh, in the case of the spines on a cactus, they are a transformed leaf. And instead of the genetic material unfolding the leaf structure as it develops, it folds in upon itself, so it's a different expression of the same gene. And instead of the stem developing like a stem, it flattens out and develops like a leaf as a water conservation measure. So obviously this was not required in a perfect world, this is a post-perfect world addition, but there's no new genetic material. So this is not evolution, this is a regression. 
If we take the thorns of a rose, for example, they are epidermal or cortical outgrowths. Now, every human being can experience that if they want to. They can start taking a spade and dig around in the garden to cultivate the ground, and eventually, if they do it enough, what happens to their hands? They develop calluses. But this is not evolution, this is a response to pressure, and the genetic structure is then programmed to add new material to protect the hand. So that is not an evolutionary process, it is an enactment of pre-existing genetic information. The same with the thistle. It is the transformed petal of a, of a flower that is stiffened and becomes dry and hard and prickly. So this is not new genetic material, so you cannot really term it evolution at all. So, so far, we haven't seen any evolution, but only transformation and regression. Now, Darwin made a point of using parasites to explain his theory. So let's have a look at parasites. What are parasites? Parasites are creatures that feed and live off other creatures while hijacking, as it were, their metabolic machinery, mostly not killing them, but sapping them of their strength. And if we look at the parasites, like the roundworms and the tapeworms that we have over here, these are creatures that are highly regressed in their structure. A tapeworm doesn't have eyes, doesn't need eyes, can't see anything in the, in the alimentary canal of another creature. It doesn't have a digestive system. Why should it have one? It's living in, in your digestive system, so it hijacks your digestive system. So the eyes are not there, the digestive structures are not there, and so parasites are reduced organisms. Is that evolution? Or is that the deactivation of the law or the loss of genetic material? Now the story gets even more interesting because if you look at pathogens, for example, these are bacteria that cause sicknesses and the like, uh, when they become pathogenic, is this because they have developed new genes, have undergone evolutionary change, or what makes them a pathogen in the first place? Well, like any organism that re reproduces sexually, they can actually transfer genetic material from one organism to another. It's called a plasmid, a small fragment of DNA which the bacterial cells have, which is packed and then transferred to a recipient from a donor, spliced into the DNA with very precise enzymatic activity, and then the creature has now acquired immunity or resistance to pesticides or herbicides or antibiotics, but there's no new genetic material. It's just transferred genetic material. It's just like every human being we see on this planet looks slightly different from their ancestors because the material has been repackaged, but it's a very precise process. So no new material, and all this acquired immunity doesn't make them evolutionary products, but just reconstrued organisms. Now, how is all of this possible? Well, there's a new science in the world which has taken the world by storm. It's the science of epigenetics. Now, epigenetics is a fascinating science. Because people came to the conclusion that it's not only hardcore genetic material that is transferred from one generation to another, but even diseases can be transferred from one generation to another, which are not built into the hardware of the genetic material, or behavioral patterns, or mental patterns can be transferred. And the reason why this happens is because genes are marked. They're wrapped around proteins called histones, and then genes can be marked for activity or for deactivation by methylating the genes. 
So a gene that is tightly wrapped around one of these histones will not be active, will not be read. So let's say that this gene that is tightly wrapped around this histone is a gene that functions in the development of legs. If it's tightly wrapped around there, it will not give the necessary information to develop those legs. If it's not so tightly wrapped, it might be partly activated and you can get rudimentary legs. If it's totally open, then it will be red and act normally. So this new science is absolutely fascinating because you can have rapid changes in structure, in appearance, in one generation. And scientists would say, well, this would take millions of years to develop this, but just by this process, you get it in one generation. So it's not evolution. And uh, seeing that you can transfer character traits, it becomes even more fascinating, because generally when, when reproduction takes place, most of the genes are set back to the zero state, but some of them actually aren't. So eating habits, for example, can be transferred from one generation to another. Nervous dispositions can be transferred from one generation to another. Uh, the way your hormones act, whether you are an aggressive person or whether you are a mild person, can be transferred from one generation to another. This is a new deal, which nobody suspected before. And if you rigorously change your habits from your predecessors, you can actually stop the genetic marking and change the situation. But it can still take a few generations to get it out of the blueprint. Now, isn't it interesting that the Bible says character traits are carried forth to the third and fourth generation? Just an interesting point. So is this something that could explain it? Epigenetics, a turning point in our understanding of heredity. There is increasing evidence that epigenetic modifications are transgenerational. They go from one generation to the other. Inherited through multiple generations in a variety of species. Ex examples, coat color in mammals, eye color in uh, Drosophila, the fruit fly that they have investigated, symmetry in flowers, longevity. The same Absolute identical genetic material with different implantation can make one organism live twice as long, can make a creature twice the size as the other one in one generation. So this puts a totally new spin on the paradigm. So for example, the difference in coat color in these two genetically identical mice is due to epigenetic modification. Now, Darwin knew nothing about genes. And he certainly knew nothing about epigenetics. Epigenetics, epigenetics can be explained in terms of software. The genes represent the hardware, and the epigenes represent the software which govern how the hardware is going to be used. Now everybody knows that a computer has the same hardware as the next computer, but depending on the software, you can either design buildings and be architecturally inclined, or you can be a poet, depending on what software you use. So the hardware is programmable and usable in thousands of different ways, which puts a total new spin on variability. Now, Darwin spoke about parasites. Now, here is a, a, a barnacle. A barnacle is really a crab-like little creature that has uh, a little shell around it, but not all the barnacles are sessile sitting on rocks. Some of them are actually free swimming little organisms that are parasites on crabs. Now, when such a parasite becomes involved in a crab structure, it develops within the crab and it's called an interna inside and uh, it is like a tumor growing in the organism. Eventually, this is what happens. This is the female cypret. It invades crabs, and that develops into a parasite with internal root system, which is internal. And once the interna matures, 
it will develop a reproductive body outside of the crab. So this is not the crab's reproductive body, this is a parasite. Fascinating. And inside, there are just these strands which have grown into the crab and sap the crab of its energy and nutrients, and the parasite uses it just to create these reproductive structures. And then the little males come and they fertilize these eggs on the outside and uh, then when the eggs develop they become part of the plankton system and the whole system starts all over again. So this is a disgusting looking parasite consisting of nothing else but strands throughout this living crab and then the reproductive system. But the interesting thing is it has a free-living form, which is part of the plankton system, where it feeds like any other creature. And it has all the structures that it needs to live. It has eyes, it has a mouth, it has movement capabilities, it has digestive systems. It's a complete creature. So here's my question. In this disgusting-looking parasite that consists of strands and a reproductive system, are the genes for eyes and mouth and reproductive systems and locomotory organs, are they all there? Yes or no? Sure, they must be there. Because the larva has them. And then when the larva invades a crab, they all disappear. How did that happen? Is that evolution? Darwin, is that millions of years of evolution? Or the fact that it is now in the crab gives the environmental signals to the genetic systems, marks them, and deactivates the germ, the genes, by wrapping them around the histone proteins, deactivating, and all the structures that normally constitute a living organism disappear, and what remains is the strandy organism and a reproductive system. It's all it needs. It's all it needs. So is this evolution? No. This is deactivation of gene patterns, and why should it be necessary? Well, if you have a world that has become what it is today, changed from what it was in its time of perfection to imperfection, food sources disappear, well, then animals have two choices. If their food source disappears, they either go extinct or they change their food source. And so parasitism is just one of the avenues, but it doesn't mean when it was good, when it was very good, that these creatures were designed to be parasites. They're just a reminder of what has become of the world owing to the situation described in the book of Genesis. So let's look at some other creatures which are parasites. The mosquito. The mosquito is a bloodsucker and it can draw with the apparatus that it has, which is like a mini drill, this proboscis. It can drill holes into your skin and suck the blood. But then fortuitously, it has enzymes which prevent the coagulation of the blood. Obviously, if you were to have the blood coagulate in that little straw, that would become a very complicated sucking experience. You'd have a clogged apparatus. So these chemicals prevent the clotting of blood. Now this must have taken millions of years to develop, right? Well, the interesting thing is, it's only the female that sucks blood and not the male. And he has the same structure and he has the same chemical composition in his structure, but what does he use it for? Well, he uses it to suck plant juices. Now, obviously, this is enough to satisfy his needs, so he does not need to suck blood. But if the plant juice does not provide for him or to the female everything that is necessary to produce the eggs and all the energy that goes into that, augmentation of the diet with another fluid rich in nutrients would be very advantageous. So they switched. But if the food supply had still been what it was originally, then there would have been no need to switch, and there wouldn't have been a parasite, and the animal wouldn't have been a pest, and it wouldn't have transmitted diseases. So it could have been very good, but what we have now 
is a change paradigm. So that applies, of course, to all creatures that inflict pain and suffering by injecting all kinds of chemicals into their prey. Now, if we look at wasps and bees and all of these creatures, well, isn't that an evolutionary development? To have a sting, to be able to kill animals in order to utilize them for whatever purpose? Well, the answer is, all of these structures are nothing other than transformed ovipositors. So they are structures that were originally designed for egg laying, and there are glands associated with these structures that produce the nutrients that go into an egg. Now, those nutrients are proteins, and if those proteins should be injected, well, they will cause severe reactions. Everybody knows that you can eat the poison gland of a snake, and it'll do nothing to you because you will just digest the protein. But if you inject it straight into the bloodstream, well, that's a totally different story. You'll have a, a tremendous reaction. So the sting of a bee is designed with a barb, so it actually gets stuck in mammalian tissue, so it's not a very good mechanism. So was it originally designed to kill, to inflict pain? Or did it have another purpose? Now, if you look at bees, for example, they're rather fascinating. Because in bees you have a colony and you have all these sterile workers and you have one reproductive entity which is called the queen. And she produces all the eggs for the colony. Now, the interesting thing is, if the queen should die, then the workers could change their diet, some of them, and partake of the royal jelly. And when they do that, they actually start changing and becoming queens. So my question is, does a little worker bee have all the genes it takes to be a queen? Obviously, otherwise they couldn't change. Now what is the marker that makes the difference? The difference in diet. Here's another question. Can the diet that you partake in have dramatic effects on your anatomy, yes or no? Obviously. Because the whole anatomy of the little worker changes and it becomes a big, fat, egg-laying queen. So what you eat can activate certain markers and change uh, conditions in the same way environmental markers can change an organism. Now, this is not evolution. This is a complex structure that is so intricate and needs such precision that it smacks of design. So the fact that wasps kill animals and lay their eggs in them doesn't mean that they were originally designed to do so. That brings me to carnivores. Darwin said the fact that a cat plays with a mouse and then eventually tortures it to death and eats it up, it doesn't seem to be the story of a beneficent loving God who loves all of his creatures, but this is well, compatible with the theory of evolution. And after all, if you look at a carnivore, this is the skull of a lion, the teeth tell you already that this creature is a killer. If you have canines this size, it means that you were designed to kill. And then the teeth at the back are like shears, so they are designed to tear flesh. This creature evolved over millions of years to become a carnivore. That is modern thinking. And then, of course, it has a different behavioral pattern. Everybody knows that if you go for a walk in a game park and you come across a lion, then uh, a certain fear wells up in the body, the sweat starts pouring down because this animal is dangerous. Whereas if you see a little deer, you say, oh, how sweet, no problem and the lion will be aggressive. So you know these things. Now, why are these creatures so different? Is it millions of years of evolution? Well, the Russian scientist Dmitry Balayev took foxes and he bred with them. And he took the wild ones that were aggressive and if cornered would, would bite. And he bred for eight generations, and in each generation he took the mild, gentle ones from the litter 
and carried on breeding with them. And after eight generations, they were like domestic dogs. Totally calm, they would sit on the lap, they would be just like a dog. All the aggression was gone. So it cannot be evolution because that takes millions of years of chance uh, mutations. So this must have some other reason. So they analyzed the, the structures, the glands, the adrenal glands, the hormone levels, and they found that in these creatures, serotonin levels were mark markedly raised over the wild type. And serotonin is a hormone that is produced in the brain that affects behavior. For example, in people that have uh, diseases of the mind, for example, schizophrenia, they have greatly depressed serotonin levels. So if you give them medication and those levels are improved, then they can be normal or act normal. And so this, the difference in behavior was just the difference in hormone levels. The adrenal glands were considerably smaller in the domesticated one because they didn't have the adrenaline, the adrenaline rush and the aggression that goes along with it. So behavior of these creatures was purely a matter of levels of hormones. Fascinating. So that doesn't take millions of years to develop. Now what about tooth structure and diet? Well, here's a bear. You can see that it's classified as a carnivore on the basis of its teeth. And surely, yes, it is carnivorous. A bear will eat fish. A bear will be opportunist and kill a creature and eat it. And uh, therefore, he must have been a carnivore in terms of his evolutionary progress. So when do bears partake of fish? Obviously, in North America, when the salmon run is, is on the go, then fish is on the menu. Now this is immediately after the melting of the snow, so there's no real plant material around of any value, so the bear eats fish. But the salmon run comes and it's gone. And by then, spring is there and the plants appear. And what does the bear do then? Well, he becomes a herbivore. And they eat grasses. So in spite of the fact that it is classified as a carnivore, over 80% of its general diet consists of plant material. And the other can be construed to be part of the diet just because the occasion demands it. There is no other food to eat, so you either eat that or you don't. Of course, their grumpy disposition and everything that goes along with it is a matter of hormones. Now, if we go to the panda bear, where we don't have the conditions as you have in North America, where you have tropical conditions and the plant material is there throughout the year, all the time, then uh, the panda bear doesn't have to go to those extremes. So what does the panda bear eat? Bamboo? That's its diet. So the panda bear, although classified as a carnivore based on its teeth, has a diet that consists of bamboo. So here is my question. Do the teeth necessarily dictate the fact that this creature has to be a carnivore? Obviously not, because within the, in the group you have this great variety. Now, I was at the Sydney Zoo, and I was interested to see this plaque, so I took a photograph of it, and it says, Red pandas are classified as carnivores, meat eaters, <sighs> but most of their diet is bamboo. So tooth structure does not mean that you have to be a carnivore. Now the koala bear is not a bear, but nevertheless, it eats only eucalyptus. And it seems to do very well because most of its life is spent sleeping. And uh, these cuddly little creatures can sleep most of the day away, and all they subsist on is eucalyptus leaves. So the diet of a creature and the tooth structure does not necessarily dictate the one or the other. 
Now in Job chapter 12, verse 7, there's an interesting verse and verse 8. But now ask the beasts, and they will teach you. And the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. And the fish of the sea will explain it to you. I found this rather a fascinating verse. So I went to the beasts, and I went to the birds, and I went to the fish, and I said, excuse me, could you please explain circumstances to me? And of course, they can't do it with their uh, vernacular. They can't use their voice to tell me what the situation is, but I can study their biology and their anatomy, and perhaps they can tell me something. And so, for example, if you look at a fish, and you look at its kidney, there are its internal structures. It has all the organs of other creatures, and it has a kidney. And in that kidney, there's a structure which is called the glomerulus. Fascinating structure. And uh, mammals have kidneys with malpighian bodies and glomeruli. And these structures serve as ultrafiltration systems. So the blood comes in via this vessel, breaks up into capillaries, which means when the blood comes in via a big vessel, breaks up into small ones, it's like putting a kink in a hose pipe. With the water coming in, what do you notice? What does your hose pipe do? It swells. Now, if it were slightly porous, the water would leak out, and the same thing happens in a glomerulus. The water leaks out, and the blood supply goes through an efferent arteriole, which is smaller, so that there's constant pressure in the structure. And this structure constantly ultrafiltrates liquid and gets rid of it in the form of urine. Now the problem is that the fish are supposed to have evolved in the sea. And in the sea, the water is concentrated because there's salt in the water. So the concentration of the sea is about two-thirds higher than it is in the fish. So the concentration in the sea is about 1,000 milliosmolar, and the fish is about 350 milliosmolar. So it's about a third as salty as the sea. Consequence, the fish is constantly losing water by osmosis. So the fish is dehydrating. So the way to augment its supply is to drink water. But it's drinking seawater. So now it needs desalinators. So in the gills, there are desalinators which get rid of the salt so that they actually desalinate the salt. But if the kidney were to produce this vast amount of liquid and it was to lose this liquid as well, the fish would not survive in the sea. So here's the problem. The fish in the sea, in its kidney, has structures which it cannot survive with. So what does it do? Well, the solution is to become functionally aglomerular, to switch the system off so they contract this blood vessel so that the structure doesn't work. So it has the structure, but it doesn't use it. Now if the fish were to go up a freshwater stream, like the salmon does, from the sea, up a river, now the story is reversed. Now it's in fresh water and it is more salty than the fresh water. So water comes into the fish via osmosis and it has to get rid of the water. Now without this structure it would explode in fresh water. So it needs it. Question. If the fish evolved in the sea, as most evolutionary science uh, presupposes, then why did it develop a structure that it cannot use unless it is in fresh water? Or what is the probability that the sea was not always salty? Is that a possibility? If, have we a changed system? So by asking the fish, is it possible that conditions were different in the past to what they are now, the fish via its glomerulus tells me, yes they were different. And if you read the biblical paradigm, you will see that structures and uh, environmental conditions changed because of calamities that were introduced 
which the Bible talks about, such as the universal flood. Now, just for interest's sake, if we look at a mammalian kidney with this structure, the glomerulus, and the possibility here of concentrating the urine, this structure over here, this Malpighian body with this loop of Henle, is so complicated. It has so many enzyme systems which make one side permeable and the other side impermeable and enzyme gates and you name it. It is highly complex. And the interesting thing is it cannot function at all if it doesn't have this configuration. So there's no incremental way of changing it from one that cannot produce concentrated urine to one that can. It has to be perfect. We call that irreducible complexity. It cannot develop slowly. So these structures tell me that there is a design attached to them because they cannot evolve over time. So the animals, by studying them, can give us information that uh, can change our paradigms. Now, if I ask this lion, excuse me, were you by any chance at one stage a vegetarian, then every scientist on the globe would comment that I've probably gone insane. And in fact, it actually happened to me, because if I gave lectures on this issue, then many, many scientists would tell me, but these creatures are evolved to be carnivores. It's not just a question of tooth structure. The whole creature is designed to be a killing machine. Look at those muscles. This is a powerful creature. It can run and catch creatures and it can kill creatures. And it has all the equipment necessary for doing this very thing. And then the internal anatomy is different. The intestine is much shorter than that of a herbivore. A carnivore only has about six times the length of its body in its gut whereas a herbivore can have up to 22 times the length. So there's a vast difference between the one and the other. Surely this takes millions of years to evolve. And then, of course, the meat-rich diet makes for plenty of leisure time. So most of the time is spent snoozing somewhere under a tree. And you mean to tell me that this creature over here, the rival to the lion, for the king position, was also a herbivore. That seems rather ridiculous. Well, judging by the teeth, they are carnivores. They have the canines, they have everything that is required to do what they have to do, and so is the wolf. It has the structures, it's designed to be a carnivore, and this creature with its terrible jaw power and massive teeth, well, obviously designed to rip bones apart and uh, eat what is left over. So these are killing machines and cleanup machines par excellence. Evolution is written all over them. And the further they go away from the original herbivore plan, by the way, the uglier they get. And the dingo? Well, the dingo is nothing but a dog. It interbreeds with other dogs. It was introduced by Asian seafarers, and yet everybody claims that it is the super example of evolution. There's no evolution there at all. It's a dog. If it interbreeds with other dogs, it's a dog. So the jackals, the fox, the coyote, all of these creatures, where do they come from and how can one claim that they were anything other than carnivorous? What about the birds of prey? The scriptures say every bird, use the word every, every bird was herbivorous. Surely these creatures weren't herbivorous. Look at a, an eagle. It's designed with a sharp beak to kill, or an owl with its stealth capability, or any one of these birds of prey. All of them have the tools and the equipment to grab, to hold, to kill. Were they designed that way? Did it come about by evolution? This is the New Zealand key par parrot. It's a, it's a little parrot, and it has a sharp little beak, 
and it has claws like any other bird, and its diet is the root of a particular tree. Except when, through urbanization, they removed the trees from the areas, and suddenly this little bird became a killing machine. And it was fascinating what it ate. It went and sat on the back of sheep, attached itself to the wall, and then with a sharp little beak dug its way through the back until it got to the fat around the kidney, and it ate the fat around the kidney, and the sheep died. And of course, that created great consternation. Now, imagine that some virus or disease had destroyed the original food source of this creature, then it would have been a killer. And if Darwin had come to Australia and New Zealand and he had found these creatures and seen their carnivorous habits, he would have said, well, with a sharp beak like that, it's obviously through evolution that it was transformed into a creature that had become a killing machine. But when they replanted the trees, what happened? It went back to its original diet. So, original and current do not necessarily tell the same story. So, if the earth was cursed and much of the plant material disappeared, then creatures would have to eat something else. That's pretty logical. Now, if you look at the paleontological record, you will find that in the paleontology there are vastly more varieties of plants than we have today. So there must have been food sources which are no longer available, which means that the animals that used to eat them either changed their diet or disappeared. A parrot is certainly capable of taking your finger off with that beak, with its bite power, but that beak and that grabbing claw can be used to kill or it can be used to crack nuts and uh, it depends on the circumstances. Now, I had a friend who had a parrot, and this parrot used to sit on top of his cage, and they'd put him outside, his wing was obviously clipped, and uh, it was their pet parrot, and when they came outside, they would see dead birds lying around the cage, and they couldn't figure out what was going on, until one day, they observed him for a long period of time and saw what he was doing. Obviously he was bored, so he had the habit of taking his food, his seeds, and throwing them around, around the cage. And then he'd sit perched there and wait for the birds to come and pick up the seeds, and when they were there, he'd kill them. And there were all these birds, it was a game to him. So he has the capacity to kill, but it doesn't mean he was designed to be a killer. In fact, the animals were subject to man and they were supposed to bring pleasure to man. And if they had the right diets, then they would be as they should be. If you take the piranha, it's a ferocious meat eater, but its close relative, the paku, with which it, by the way, can interbreed, is a total vegetarian. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you were designed to do what you are doing today. If you look at chipmunks, we all know what their diet is. It consists of seeds. But today, if the forest is depleted of food sources, they will be found eating roadkill, for example. Now surely that is not their original diet. This is a new development owing to environmental changes which have taken place or rodents. Rodents can be carnivorous, rodents can be plant eaters, but even if they are plant eaters, then they become coprophags, which means they ingest their own excreta. Now surely that's not good, very good. So why is this so? Well, you see, the fermentation of these products takes place behind the intestine, so that it has to be re-ingested again in order to get the nutrients. But if the plants had their original capacity, that would not be necessary. In the same way, you will find that equids, horses and zebras also are coprophags, and even elephants will coprophag. 
So let's get back to the question. Lion, is it possible that you could have been a vegetarian at some stage? Well, after I'd uh, given a lecture, it was actually in North America, where people had said that it must take millions of years to develop these changes in the anatomy of the gut, I went home with the idea of doing some experiment to see whether this was so. But I had a student who was working on chickens. Now I admit that a chicken is not a lion, but the principle is the same. And because she was working on antibiotic resistance as it develops uh, in creatures, because of the, the problem which this creates in, in modern society, we had these chickens on different regimes from hatching until market size, which is one and a half kilograms, which takes about six weeks. So it's a six week program. And we wanted to see whether certain diets and antibiotics affect antibiotic resistance. But some of them were on a plant regime and some of them were on an animal protein regime. So here are the diets as they are uh, described over here. So we don't have to go into the detail. Those chickens that were on a vegetarian regime, they had maize and, or corn, they call it in America, corn and soy as their food source. And then we had groups with antibiotics and without antibiotics. And the other group had the same diet, the basic diet, but added to it, they had fish meal, which they do in the industry, because we wanted to see if animal protein in some way enhances or decreases antibiotic resistance. And so we had another group on the same diet with uh, antibiotics. And if we look at the, the results, the growth rates on the various dietary regimes, A, total plant diet, B, the same diet plus antibiotics, and C, animal protein, and D, the same diet, animal protein, plus, of course, the plant proteins, and antibiotics. And statistically, no difference in the growth rate of the creatures. So it didn't matter whether they were the one or the other. When it came to gut mass, then it became interesting. If they were on plant regimes, plus antibiotics, they were higher in gut mass than those that were in an animal regime, plus antibiotics. And so there was a distinct difference. But when it came to the gut length, it was fascinating. Plant protein, the longest gut. Add antibiotics, shorter gut. Animal protein, shorter gut. Animal protein plus antibiotics, still shorter gut. So the question is, can diet affect gut length in one generation? And the answer is yes. So it doesn't take millions of years. So obviously, here is one of those situations where the epigenetics control the expression of the genes and determine how long the gut needs to be. Now what we also found that was interesting is that whether they received only plant protein or some animal protein, if you added antibiotics to either of these diets, then heart mass increased. That's interesting. So the hearts actually became enlarged and heavier, but weaker. Now here's my question. Can the mere addition of a chemical like an antibiotic actually affect the anatomy of a heart? Obviously, yes. So your anatomy can change depending on what you are eating. And this is not evolution. This is different expression of genetic material. In the same way, liver size was enlarged when you added an antibiotic to either of these dietary regimes. So your anatomy can be changed by what you eat. Here's a, an article in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition which says that a high ratio of dietary animal to vegetable protein increases the rate of bone loss and the risk of fracture in, menopause, in menopausal women. And then they compare women who eat animal protein versus vegetable protein and they come to the conclusion that the more plant protein you eat, the stronger your bones are. Interesting. So can what you eat affect your bone structure? And the answer is yes. So there's more than meets the eye to the old adage, you are what 
you eat. Well, I was involved in a very interesting experiment where the industry found that sheep that were stall fed, in other words, sheep that didn't run around and get exercise, but were just stall fed, like many sheep are today. And many of them, of these creatures, receive animal protein in their diet. Because the theory is, a protein is a protein is a protein. What does it matter if it comes from a plant source or from an animal source? And I'd given a lecture where I said it makes a vast difference whether it's from an animal or from a plant. Because animal protein and plant protein differs in its amino acid composition. So animal protein will have far more sulfur-containing amino acids and will be far more acid-forming than plant protein. So plant protein will tend to give you an alkaline system, whereas animal protein will tend to give you an acid system. And because this has to be regulated via calcium from the bone, it could explain why these stall-fed animals that received animal protein developed weak legs. And they said, that's impossible, can't be. So I said, let's do an experiment, which we then did. So we took young re weaned rams and we divided them into groups and we fed them different dietary regimes. Now the one group received 12% protein levels, all plant-based. So basically their diet consisted largely of alfalfa. Alpha, alpha. The next group received exactly the same diet with 3% animal protein added in the form of fish meal. The next group received exactly the same diet with 5% animal protein added. And the next group received the same diet with 8% animal protein diet. So you had incremental increase in animal protein. And then to double check, we took another group and we took the same basic diet, but we added 8% plant protein in the form of gluten. So here were these different groups. Now, what happened in their development? Well, fascinatingly, when you look at skewness of the legs, with 50% meaning there is no skewness, either this way or the other way. Uh, as you added animal protein, the legs got skewer. So as the concentration increased, the legs got skewer. But when you added plant protein, it didn't happen. So here is a normal looking sheep, shaven so that you can see it nicely, good bone structure, nice structure, this one, 5%. The legs are slightly bowed, this one, 8% total catastrophe. In fact, this sheep, as you can see, my colleague is lifting him up because he wouldn't stand by himself. So when we analyzed all these bones and uh, the structures, you can see what it looks like, much deformity here in the, in the joints, etc. Uh, we looked at the bone calcium to phosphorus ratio and saw that the ratio calcium to phosphorus actually decreased as we added animal protein. So there was less calcium in the bone. So obviously the animal was releasing calcium from the bone to neutralize the additional acid and this caused bone weakness and deformity. Not only that, we looked at calcium loss in the urine and the stools and uh, this is now only the top group, the 20% protein, whereby the animal protein had 8% animal protein and the other one had all plant protein, either from alfalfa and um, gluten. And if you look at the calcium loss in the urine and the stool, the animal protein group lost more than double the amount of calcium in the, in the urine than the one that received the plant protein. If we look at the deformity, the animal protein one was highly deformed compared to the other group. And if you looked at the calcium phosphorus ratio, there was a massive difference. The structure was far better in uh, the group that received the plant protein. Now I'm not gonna discuss this graph in detail, just this one is interesting. We wanted to compare apples with apples and pairs with pairs. So we wanted to look 
at a specific growth period. Now you can do that by giving the animal an injection of tetracycline which marks the bone and you can see it under fluorescent light. And then we let the animal grow for 10 days, give it another marker and then under the microscope you have two lines and you have exactly 10 days bone growth in between the two because these were growing animals. And this is the tetracycline double label experiment. And then we looked at the anatomy of the bone and you can make a mathematical formula where you can look at the structure of the bone to see whether it has developed into a good bone lattice with normal histological features or whether it is weakened and deformed. And what we found was fascinating. This is the 12% plant protein group and if you look at all the formulas attached to this mathematical model which I don't have to go into, the bone structure was perfect in strength, durability, everything that goes together with bone anatomy. If you added 3% animal protein, the structure deteriorated. If you added 5%, it deteriorated more. If you added 8% animal protein, it was a catastrophe. If you added 8% plant protein, perfection again. So the microanatomy of the bone was altered by the amount of protein that was taken in, in the form of animal protein. Now, the fascinating thing is that people say, now excuse me, this is a sheep. It's not supposed to eat animal protein. The interesting thing is, if you do the same thing with a dog, or with a cat, or with a pig, or any other animal, you get exactly the same result. Which leads to one conclusion. And that is that all of these animals were actually designed to eat plant protein. Fascinating. Now if we look at human anatomy, they'll tell us we're sort of intermediary, we are designed to be omnivores. Now here's another creature, and uh, this particular monkey, if we ask him to open his mouth for us, will show us that he has a set of canines which would make a lion proud. And yet he's a total vegetarian, so again, tooth structure does not determine the diet. And then even the intestinal length of the human being is determined by what he eats. So there are, can be anatomical changes which take place rapidly. Now in the evolutionary thinking, if there is a structure in the body, then it must have an evolutionary past. And so if, if we have vestigial organs, like the appendix or any one of those, then obviously these structures were once useful and are no longer useful and they're used as evidence for evolution. So the gill structures apparently which develop and the, the, uh, the eye structures which are not necessary and the appendix and all of these. And this list of vestigial organs by Widersheim in 1895 consisted of about a hundred organs. And everybody said they were obsolete organs from our evolutionary past. Well today we know that this is not the case. The thymus which was on that list triggers the immune system and it activates T systems. The pineal gland we know is important for melatonin. Thyroid gland was on that list, it produces thyroxine. Pituitary gland become, became the master endocrine gland. And uh, the semilunar folds of the eye, they cleanse and lubricate the eyeball, or the appendix is absolutely essential in determining friend and foe in the bacterial world in that early immunological development. So there is no vestigial organ. So that fell by the wayside. And here is a publication which says, since it's not possible to unambiguously identify useless structures, and since the structure of the argument used is not scientifically valid, I conclude that vestigial organs provide no special evidence for the theory of evolution. Interesting, it's published in the Evolution Journal. So, again, science has a problem. They also like to use homology. They say, well, we're all related because we have similar leg and arm structures. 
And uh, the human, by the way, is the most primitive hand, pentadectyle, five fingers. A horse walks on one finger and then only on the fingernail, the hoof. So why should the most advanced creature have the most primitive hand, etc.? Now, interestingly, the zoomology tells you, according to the evolutionary theory, that everything is related. But as the evolutionary scientist Fix wrote, the older textbooks on evolution make much of the dear idea of homology, pointing out the obvious resemblances between the skeleton of the limbs of different animals. Thus, pentadectyle pattern is found in man, in the bird, in the flipper of a whale, etc., etc., etc. Now he writes, now if these various structures were transmitted by the same gene couples varied from time to time by mutation and acted upon by environmental selection, the theory would make good sense. Unfortunately, this is not the case. Homologous organs are now known to be produced by totally different gene complexes in the different species. So the whole concept of homology in terms of similar genes handed down from a common ancestor has broken down. There's no such thing on the genetic level. So my friend Darwin, he used the parasite. The parasite doesn't speak for evolution, on the contrary, it speaks of degeneration. If we look at irreducible complexity, it cannot have evolved because it has to be perfect in order to function in the first place. The changes that take place do not have to take place over millions of years because you can go from giant to small in one generation, from one color to another, different structures developing very rapidly by epigenetic mechanisms. So if I look at the world today, I can put on Darwin's glasses and look at them and all the creatures and say, oh, I don't see beneficence on all sides. I see death and destruction and parasites. Therefore, evolution is correct. Nothing else works. But I could look at the world and I could look at this beauty and the symmetry in the flowers. And I could look at the variety and the colors. And I come to the conclusion, there's no need for beauty and symmetry in order to reproduce. Do you have to be beautiful in order to reproduce? Does a dog, such as an Afghan hound with its long blonde hair, care what the mutt looks like that he wants to reproduce with? Doesn't care. It's a hormonal action. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be beautiful. So why, why do we need beauty? Why do we need it? Why do birds display these beautiful colors, their secondary sex characteristics? Is the male attracting all the attention to himself? Or was there another reason why they were so pretty? If you look at the sacred ibis, it's a beautiful bird, beautiful colors, but it's related to the bald ibis, which is anything but beautiful. And the difference between the two, very closely related, Differences in habitat, differences in diet, epigenetic changes, very rapid. It doesn't take millions of years. And by the way, they can interbreed and the offspring is sort of half pretty, half ugly. So this doesn't take millions of years to develop. Or if you look at these beautiful birds with their different colors and their different attitudes, isn't this to gratify the eye of the beholder or the delicacy of some of these creatures and the mild gentle habits as to the more excitable squawky habits variety is the spice of life this smacks of design and weren't we supposed to interact and have relationships with these creatures if you look at these flowers and the beauty that is written all over them or these, or the magic of a sunset. Is it just conjecture that there is a designer involved in all of this beauty? Isaiah chapter 65 verse 17 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. So the Old Testament says, that that which we see now, which Darwin saw, is going to be transformed back to what it was. And then, 
this pain and this suffering will be over because the creatures were not willingly subjected to this, but as a consequence of the actions. The New Testament says the same thing, Second Peter, nevertheless, we according to his promise look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, which means that the character, the image of God will be restored. So this is the hope of the scriptures, whether it was Old Testament or whether it was New Testament. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the Son of God, says Paul. For the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly, but by reason of him that has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. I wonder whether Darwin looked at this text in the right context because he was bemoaning the fact that everything is suffering. But here is a reason given. And the changes do not have to take place over millions of years. Isaiah chapter 11 verses 6 to 9, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child will lead them. I assume, according to this text, that the aggression in these creatures will disappear. Now, I come from Africa, and if you've ever been confronted by a charging elephant or a charging lion, you know exactly what fear is all about. And uh, here, a little child will lead them, which means that that gentleness will again come to the fore. It doesn't take millions of years. Just putting the hormonal state in its right state will produce it. And the cow and the bear shall feed. The young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Where it says that the lion will become a vegetarian again, and you look at Darwin where he said, the fact that the cat plays with the mouse is evidence for evolution. Now, we've looked at the situation, knowing what we know now about the science of epigenetics, of the changes that can take place rapidly. Is it possible that one can envision the lion eating straw like the ox? Well, there are numerous examples in Africa of lions that were raised vegetarian. And it's fascinating that these lions lived longer than their other uh, protégés, and they had none of the diseases of these others. There was one famous story of a person who had a pet male lion who used to sleep on the bed with him. But uh, he had an olfactory problem. He was rather smelly. And not only his skin, but also, well, the other vapors that occasionally escaped from him were rather noxious. And so the man decided he was going to change this lion's diet and he put him on a vegetarian diet. And all of these things disappeared. This is the story of the famous vegetarian lion who became a, a TV star until they gave him meat and he died. <laughs> and uh, all kinds of interesting stories. So yes, he can subsist very well on a vegetarian diet. That has been proven. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp and the weaned child shall put his hand in the cockroach's den. Which means that the serpent will no longer be what it was. It will be back to what it was intended to be originally. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Is this an improbable story? Or is it a possibility. That's all I'm asking. If, according to the evidence, it is a possibility, then we should be allowed to make a choice based on the information. And that choice should be, I choose to believe what the scriptures say because the evidence is not overwhelming that it is not as it is stated there. 
we should have that freedom of choice. God gives us freedom of choice. And this is the purpose of this lecture, to give people a choice. We can choose to wear the glasses of Darwin, or we can choose to wear the glasses of faith. And the one is not necessarily superior to the other. Now, when the scriptures say that the child will play with the serpent, I assume that this will not be the situation. Obviously, uh, this serpent won't have the diet that it has now, and also the disposition that it has now. So this I would not consider safe, but the new serpent, where the gene systems are activated according to the original pattern, will be a different story. Now I wonder what it will be like in a world where there is harmony between man and animal and nature again. I mean, every human being longs for something that the soul cannot generate by itself. And there's nothing like association with wild animals. People love to see them. They fear them, but they would love to reach out and touch them. Now, when these animals are returned to their original state, I think this is what we will see. This man has this lion in this cage, and he's going to open the cage to have a chat to his lion. Let's see the response. <laughs> I think it is our choice whether we want to believe that God created this world and that he created man in his image and put him in command of all the creatures on this planet. And it is our choice to believe whether God will restore relationships so that they reflect what we have just seen or whether we want to go the evolutionary route. The choice is yours. Thank you.